Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending today's uh, DVP uh, ceremony, our 60th in the College of Hospitality Management. Uh, we have the privilege and honor uh, of being able to have Don Sweeney, the president and CEO of the National Restaurant Association, uh, which is located, she's located in Washington, D.C., based um, National Trade Association for the Nations, $800 billion restaurant and food service industry. So I want to take my thank you very much, take time out and say thank you for coming and um, educating us on what's happening. Uh, you have a wonderful career. And I want to read her bio because when I went through her bio, I was so impressed. Um, this, is, this is our 60th uh, DVP. And to me, um, I really admire how President Sweeney has gone through and crafted her career. One of the things that she did uh, was every place that she worked, she started at the entry level. But when she left the company, it was always at a vice president, a senior vice president, or a vice president level. And it's interesting to see how she thought of doing that, how she recognized critical thinking skills in each one of her uh, companies that she worked for. So I'd like to take the time and um, not just rush through it. Sometimes these are just short, you know, and introduce. I want to take the time and read our bio for, your, for her and honor her in doing so. Uh, president Sweeney is the president of uh, AARP Services, the taxable business uh, subsidiary of AARP, where she was responsible for revenue growth and new product development for the 50 plus market. She spent five years uh, in this position with this company, served over 40 million members. She was the AARP group executive for membership focusing on growth, diversity, brand, and building the organization's first knowledgeable uh, management capa uh, capability. She served as Vice President of Market Development for the National Rural Electric uh, Cooperative Association, which serviced over 30 million consumers across America. Through her 14 years of service with the in International Dairy Foods Association, uh, President Sweeney held the following positions. Educational Coordinator, Manager of Education, Director of Public Affairs, and Vice President of Marketing. And that's a perfect example of how she uh, built her career. She's entry level, left as a Vice President. She also participate, participated recently in the Harvard Business School's inaugural Women on Boards program in uh, 2016. President Sweeney currently serves as Vice Chair of the Board of, for Save the Children. Vice Chair of the Board of the Bryce Harlow Foundation. She is a member of the Board and Executive Committee of the American Society Association Executives. And she was recently named a fellow within the organization, a designation reserved for the top 1% of association leaders in the nation. Co-Chair of the Spirit of Mount Vernon, held on the grounds of Mount Vernon every fall. Uh, she's a member of the, of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Com uh, Committee of 100, the International Women's Forum, and serves on the membership committee in C200, a membership organization of the world's most innovative corporate entrepreneurs. She has served on the board and executive committee of the Women's Food Service Forum, and is a member of the judging panel for the industry gold and silver plate awards in the Association of National Advertisers Reggie Awards. She is an outstanding person. I've gotten to know her a little bit better over the last uh, day and a half, and uh, you can see why she's an accomplished leader. What I'd like you to learn is that her progressive leadership is what I call it, um, and I'm looking forward to her presentation on how to do that. So please welcome President Sweeney. What a lovely introduction. Thank you so much, Dean. And I, I must say, 
after a 40-year career, introduction takes a little bit longer than if you've only been working for a few years. So I've had enough experience that it takes a while to describe four decades of, uh, of experience, but it's my pleasure, um, Dean, I'm very grateful uh, for the invitation uh, to all the associate, associate Dean Fink and the faculty of this uh, wonderful College of Hospitality Management. I really want to thank you uh, for inviting me here today. I am amazed. I've always been a huge fan of Johnson & Wales, even before I was in the food industry and knew anything really specific about it, because I grew up in Maine, and everyone said, oh, Johnson & Wales, that's the place to go. That's the place to be. When I went to the Harvard Business School, I was secretly thinking, I wish I were going to Johnson & Wales. I really, truly was, and now here I am, and it's just a pleasure, uh, truly a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for inviting me and so graciously uh, hosting me uh, here in this school uh, today and yesterday. It's great to have a chance firsthand uh, to experience what I've always known uh, to be true about the excellence of the education here at Johnson & Wales and the work that you do to further the hospitality, the food service, and culinary arts uh, across the board. And uh, obviously great to be back in New England, which I uh, still consider to be my home, uh, even though I've been away for 40 years. I grew up here, I went to college here. Uh, there's nothing uh, quite the same as New England, and it's really a privilege uh, for me as well to be back home. To all of the students uh, here today, it is rejuvenating, it's inspiring to be with you. Uh, you, of course, as we all know, and as you know, are the future of our industry. And while it's my honor and privilege to lead the National Restaurant Association for the last 10 years, uh, you and I are all joined together in a love and a devotion and a passion for this industry that is unlike any other in this country. I think, uh, as my bio was being uh, read, I think that my entire uh, professional life has prepared me to be able to stand uh, before you here today. From my earliest years, food has been a very important part of who I am. I was raised on a farm in a fairly rural part of Maine. And from the time I was small, one thing I did was work very, very hard. We worked hard on the farm, I worked hard in school, and alongside my grandfather, my brother, my parents, we built fences and we milked cows, we baled hay, and we grew and we picked 40 acres of beans and strawberries, potatoes and corn that we sold on our family roadside farm, roadside stand. After going to college, at Colby College in Maine, a school I'd never be accepted to if I applied today, but I fortunately went in when the acceptance standards were different than they are today. Uh, after I graduated there and wanted to stay in Maine, there were no jobs at that time, so I had to move away. I moved to Washington, D.C., uh, where I've worked, as you heard, in four different industries, from the dairy foods industry to uh, electric utility industry to AARP, and now, for the last 10 years, the restaurant industry. For each of these four industries that I've had the privilege to represent, I've learned about that industry from the ground up and uh, have also always surrounded myself, which in my case is not difficult, with people who know more than I do. Uh, and I have been a part of some incredible teams and whatever successes I have had are due uh, in very large part to the fact that I have always uh, been privileged to be surrounded uh, by incredible people. There's a Japanese word for the idea that big results come from many small changes that are accumulated over time. And it's called the spirit of Kaizen. And I think that summarizes my own career. It's been a series of daily challenges and opportunities to learn. I try to approach each day as a chance to be better than I was the day before. And I try to do something, often something very small, each day that's outside my comfort zone. I am one, one thing I am is never satisfied with wherever we are at our point in the journey for whatever organization of which I'm a part. And I always try to get to the next level. It's a huge part of my own DNA. And I think innovation and continuous improvement and growth is very likely a very big part of yours as well. I've definitely found my home here in the restaurant industry and coming full circle back uh, to the food service industry where I began my career. Our industry is everything that I find uplifting and exciting. The values that were instilled in me as a child of being dependable, reliable, functioning as a member of a team, being flexible when problems arise, 
and operating with a sense of purpose and service are the life lessons that have helped me to build my career and uh, bring me so happily to this industry. And I think those are the same life lessons that drew me here to the National Restaurant Association. I think we all have an instinctive belief that restaurant work teaches the kinds of life lessons that people in any industry would benefit from learning. The skills that we learn, well, in every single one of the one million restaurants across America, you see that kind of insatiable curiosity, a willingness to listen and learn, and a tremendous entrepreneurial spirit. You learn how to work with people, how to deal with wonderful and with difficult colleagues and customers. We learn on the job adjustments to challenges and issues, the importance of a smile, and the day in and day out devotion that's required to excellence. I truly believe not that everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten, but everything you really need to know about success in life, you can learn when working in the restaurant industry. And we have the data to actually back that up. The National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation studied successful professionals across many different industries. And they listed the key attributes that were necessary for success in any workplace. Then we surveyed another group of former restaurant employees about the key attributes that they learned working in a restaurant. And the correlation was amazing. We now know that restaurants teach the critical skills for life success whether that success is in a restaurant or elsewhere, from teamwork to dependability, from adaptability to initiative, from problem solving to conflict resolution. It was also very important for me to be part of an industry that is diverse. I believe, as I'm sure many of you do, that it's the collective genius of very differing points of view, differing life experiences, and differing values and priorities that lead us to the best and highest outcomes. And I am very proud to be part of an industry that truly values and promotes diversity and inclusion as a core business and social value each and every day. We are different from many other industries in this respect. 33% of restaurant businesses are majority owned by women and another 15% of restaurant business are equally owned by women and men. 40% of, of restaurants nationwide are minority owned, compared with 29% across the entire private sector. And four in 10 restaurant businesses are majority owned by minority business owners. 56% of first line supervisors and managers of food prep and service workers are women. 15% are black and African American and 21% are Hispanic. The number of Hispanic-owned restaurant businesses soared to 51% in the last decade, while black and African-American-owned restaurants jumped 49%. And both were substantially above their corresponding growth rates in the overall economy. While we also know that to be absolutely true, it is perhaps nowhere else that an individual can rise to leadership faster than they can in the American restaurant industry. I'd like to share with you a little bit about who we are at the National Restaurant Association and what we do to educate, promote, and uh, build the success of the restaurant industry. Our mission is to advance and protect America's restaurant industry, and that's a big job, uh, as was said, because our industry's scope and impact are extraordinarily immense. Restaurants are the fabric of America. We are absolutely central to this country's economy. Our $800 billion sales levels translates into about 4% of the GDP, the restaurant industry alone. We have nearly 15 million employees. One in 10 working Americans work in our industry, which is remarkable. We are the nation's second largest private sector employer after healthcare. And we operate 1 million locations, defined as traditional restaurants and away from home food service outlets. We have a presence and an impact in every single community. We are the nation's training ground. One in three American adults had their first job in our industry, and half of the people in this country have at some point worked in a restaurant at some point in their lives. We serve an amazing 
130 million consumers every single day. And we receive today about 47% of the consumer food to food dollar, and that's growing. So our sheer magnitude is impressive, but we also have very special qualities that make us unique. We are a hugely large industry made up of small businesses. About 89% of all restaurants in America are classified as small business. 90% of restaurants have fewer than 50 employees, and more than 70% are single unit operations. You all know the profit margin in this business is extremely small. Pre-tax profit margin for a typical restaurant runs from about four to six percent. We did a study recently with uh, consumers asking them, on an average $100 check, what percentage, what, what, how many dollars do you think that the average restaurant owner gets on a $100 check? And consume, the typical consumer said $40, $50, $60. They think our profit margins are huge, when in fact our profit margins are more like $4. So the servers in restaurants oftentimes on a percentage basis are making multiple what the restaurant owner is making. Four to six percent leaves very, very small margin for error. You can't make a lot of mistakes without going out of business, and we all know how challenging this industry is. We both drive and are affected by the health of our economy. And we as an industry are often the first to feel the effects when Americans cut back on their spending. And we also can be one of the first industries to recover. About 20% of restaurant sales across this country come from travelers and tourists. And in the fine dining segment, it's closer to 40%. So travel and tourism and uh, people's ability to freely move across the country and in and out of this country is hugely critical uh, to our success. And as we all know, we are extremely labor intensive. It takes a lot of great people to get great food to our guests. Labor costs in the restaurant industry, as you know, account for about 30% of sales and are relatively uh, equivalent to food costs. And recruiting and retaining employees is one of our industry's very biggest challenges right now. Part of our work at the National Restaurant Association is to advance and to protect our industry. And that means telling our industry's story, getting the word out about what restaurants do, about jobs and careers in our industry, and about the many ways that restaurants give back. We recently. Uh, uh, reviewed a study that was just completed by Gallup. They do a survey every year asking consumers which industries do they admire most. And 10 years ago, uh, when I first started and I saw that, that uh, the results of it, the restaurant industry was just above the U.S. Postal Service, which was not necessarily a particularly good place to be. It was, let's just say, not in the top 10 ranking of admired industries. Uh, for the last three years, Gallup has continued to conduct this survey. The restaurant industry has ranked number one in terms of consumers' respect and admiration, the most respected, most admired industry in America, the restaurant industry. We slipped to number two this year, even though our absolute numbers were higher than they've ever been. I think it was 72% of Americans, which was an all-time high for the restaurant industry, but the computer industry eclipsed us just a little bit because they were just growing a little bit faster than we are in terms of a reputation. So they were 74%, I think we were 72. But still, a massive shift in consumers' perception and understanding and respect for our industry, which I think is in large part uh, due to uh, the quality of the individuals who are working in this industry and people's respect for uh, those who run and work and support uh, the restaurant industry. Uh, advocacy is very central to our work. That is essentially our number one job. Uh, running a restaurant, of course, has gotten very complicated and there are financing and legal and regulatory requirements, legislative challenges, all that become a part of doing business. And it is important that members of Congress, members of the administration, federal agencies, uh, regulatory agencies all the way down the line from state legislatures to mayors to city councils all the way to the calls of Congress, understand who the restaurant industry is and what we contribute to every community in America. As 2018 has gotten underway, we're working at the national level for a health insurance system that works both for employers and employees. Uh, we've taken a lead role in Washington, D.C. to promote 
more thoughtful immigration laws that make more sense and that recognize the important role that immigrants have always played in our industry and in our country. We're working with the Food and Drug Administration to ensure a smooth transition as our members get ready to implement uh, the nation's first lab uh, menu labeling laws that go into effect in May. And our organization, the National Restaurant Association, was a key driver of that law in partnership with public health organizations uh, and others across the country. The, these, uh, this new menu labeling law, as you may know, will require chain restaurants or anyone who has 20 or more restaurant locations operating under the same name to disclose calories on menus and make other nutrition information available on request and creates a standardized way in which that information is delivered as opposed to a patchwork of different laws and regulations from city to city or state to state. These just are a few of our top uh, national priorities, but as importantly uh, is what happens, and frankly these days more importantly, <laughs> what happens at the state and local level because that is where there is so much activity uh, and our partnership certainly uh, with the Rhode Island Hospitality Association is uh, absolutely critically key uh, to our success, is, as is our partnership with the other 52 uh, state and uh, regional restaurant associations around the country. I have said this publicly uh, in many different venues, but I've actually never said it in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, the Rhode Island Hospitality Association is one of the very best state restaurant associations in this country, and there is no question about that. Uh, Heather, Dale, the whole team, just, ab and just outstanding leadership, always come through, always deliver. Don't shy away from any challenge. We are blessed uh, to have the opportunity to work with you uh, every day. We talk a lot about food safety training and certification because that's an increasingly important part of our work and there are few issues that are more important to our industry uh, because as we all know, even a single incidence of foodborne illness has the potential to put not only one restaurant out of business but the whole industry in peril. Uh, we just certified our eight millionth uh, uh, industry individual in our food safe, uh, Serve Safe Food Safety Certification Program and our ServeSafe program is now in 90 countries and in 33 languages. So we're very, uh, we're very uh, devoted to making sure that food safety continues to be at the very center, the core of our mission and our work. And with the size of our workforce, obviously we are working very hard to build our nation's next group of industry leaders. As I said, there are almost 15 million people, about 14.7 million people working in our industry today. And that's expected to grow by another 1.6 million over the next 10 years. We have an educational foundation at the national level and the state levels which are working to attract, empower, and advance our workforce. And we provide scholarships and grants at the state and the national level for our ProStart program, which provides culinary and restaurant management training to more than 140,000 high school students, uh, juniors and seniors at more than 1,800 high schools across the country and met earlier today with uh, some students, a couple of whom had come through that ProStar program and uh, had found their way then to Johnson & Wales and were very excited um, <clears throat> to have launched a new national apprenticeship program, which is a learn while you earn kind of a program that we will be rolling out uh, in restaurant management that will create certifications over a period of time in an apprenticeship way uh, for people to be certified restaurant managers. We also are hosting uh, the National Pro Start Invitational, which is a huge big deal uh, for the industry, right here in Providence, uh, the third week of April, uh, later this spring. And uh, we'll be bringing students from every state in the country uh, all to Providence to compete in kind of the, our version of the Olympics uh, for culinary and management training, which we're extremely excited to be partnering with Johnson & Wales uh, as we execute that with the Rhode Island uh, Hospitality Association. Finally, uh, our role at the NRA is also to provide the data and the insights and the connections to help our members anticipate what is next. And that's what's been so fruitful and helpful to me to be here these last, uh, this last day and a half or so to be able to learn from you what you all see, students and faculty, as the emerging trends, the challenges. You, are, you have your fingers on the pulse of what's coming in what the next five to 10 years are gonna be for our industry. And obviously the restaurant industry is in the midst of some very sweeping changes from technology to changing consumer patterns to the actual redefinition of the word and the concept of restaurant, convenience, delivery, drones, and all those things associated with that. 
when I started at the National Restaurant Association in 2007, that was the same year that Apple released the first iPhone. Two years later in 2009, the first person hailed a car with their smartphone through a small San Francisco company at that time that was called Uber Cab. Our on-demand economy has grown and grown, and last year, as we know, Amazon Prime shipped five billion items worldwide. Not a lot of those food yet, but you can see it coming. Today, with the, our smartphones that fit in our pockets, we can order a meal for delivery, we can write a review on any restaurant in the country, we can look up nutrition information, and we're serving guests who increasingly want control in all aspects of their life. They want what they want, when they want it, and they want it how they want it. They want to be able to order on any platform at any time, and they are more educated and know more about food than ever before. They demand transparency. They want to know where their food comes from and what's in it. And they care about nutrition, about food sourcing, and about food waste. And they have all kinds of options now. Competition is always fierce in our industry, but it's heating up even more as restaurants compete for the businesses that are Americans that are strapped for time and are looking for convenient, high quality food at a great value. You've all seen the changes that are unfolding. The grocer aunt is becoming a commonplace, the supermarkets that sell prepared meals that people can either take out or in many cases eat in a restaurant set environment right there in the store. As customers look for dine at home options that don't involve cooking, we're seeing restaurants that are redefining takeout. Many restaurants are forging new partnerships with third party delivery companies and others are beginning to pair in store dining with grab and go options for guests on their way out or kind of half baked things that people can take home and pretend that they cook themselves. We're seeing experimentation with virtual restaurants, restaurants that exist only online with no front of the house, no dine-in experience. Delivery only food has been called the last mile of innovation and restaurants are learning to market and engineer food specifically for delivery in stylish and safe and ecologically friendly packaging. All of this requires incredible innovation and agility to quickly cater to fast evolving consumer preferences. Restaurants will always remain, I really deeply believe this, a high touch industry. But as we know, technology is increasingly central to everything we do in all aspects of our lives. To fill out skills in hospitality, service, and culinary excellence, restaurants will need skills in logistics, supply chain efficiency, digital marketing, and real-time analytics in big data that will drive purchasing and operations throughout our entire industry. We have a four-day event in May, some of you may have been to the NRA show, where we uh, try to show the latest in innovations in food and beverage and bring more together almost 70,000 people from every part of our industry who exchange ideas and walk the floor, experimenting with hands-on learning. And then we have another trade show right in Boston, the New England Food Show, that'll be the last week of February, where we do the same thing uh, at a more um, kind of... Uh, closer in level and more intimate uh, learning environment. I really want to congratulate all of you at the students in particular on the skills that you're building both in the classroom and as you really pair theory with actual real practice. As you go through your careers, I encourage you to ask as many questions as you can to figure out where you fit in this amazing industry. I especially encourage you to learn the value of teams Restaurants provide a natural platform for team players, and they reward those who are courageous, courageous enough to play for the long run, and those who are focused on the highest and best outcomes. The reward comes not in the play-by-play -play wins, but in the aggregate impact that we can have over many months and over many years. As I opened, I mentioned that I grew up in rural Maine, and we lived away from the city. The city was a population of 14,000. Um, and so when I left my small part of town to go cross town to the city for junior high school and for high school, I was really out of my element, and I was very unsure 
of myself. Until as a junior high school student, I joined the intramural basketball team. So I was definitely not a star athlete. I wasn't even an athlete, but I was a team player. And I was really grateful to be part of something that was so magical and almost spiritual to me, to be on a team. Working together with a shared goal that was bigger than any of our own individual goals, well, it was the beginning of a new sense of purpose for me. The day in and the day out devotion to excellence, or in my case, continuous improvement, we definitely were not excellent, but we were trying to get better every day, that was motivating and life-changing, as team sports and team uh, experiences often can be. One day, however, uh, we were in a game against our local biggest rival team. The stakes were very high, this is junior high now, and the score was very close. And I witnessed one of our own junior high teammates, somebody actually on my own team, intentionally trip another player on our own team so that she could grab the ball and make the basket. And I was beside myself with disbelief. How could someone do this? Tripping another player was totally out of bounds in my book, but tripping your own teammate, unconscionable and highly unethical. We won the game that night, but it did not feel like a win to me. In fact, this experience dramatically shaped my lifelong devotion and definition of winning. While there are many routes to success, none of them go through the path of deceit and deception. And today, more than ever, we need to be ethical. We need to lift one another up and clear the way for others, remove the obstacles and that unite us in our shared mission. And to this day, the quality and behavior that I value and regard most highly in my own work teams, with my own family and with my friends, is the ability to work as a team with less regard for the player's name on the back of the jersey and a deeper devotion to the team name that's on the front. My closing uh, counsel to each of you, pay attention to the experiences that shape you. Take note of those moments of inspiration, those moments of regret, breakthrough, and heartbreak. All of those moments will be important, and every one is meaningful. The path toward your life and your career goals will have many unexpected twists, many turns, and many detours. But our industry looks very forward to welcoming you with open arms as your journeys continue. I have great hope and confidence in the future of our industry, knowing that it is in your hands. Thank you very much. Now I know we have a few minutes for questions and comments and advice and feedback, and I think we have a couple of microphones down at the front. And I would uh, welcome and entertain any questions or comments, uh, any thoughts that any of you uh, may have or sense of the future of the industry. Thank you. Got one here? Please. Hi. Um, what was your first job that you had and how did you, like, well, I mean, like, the first job that you ever had, like, in your entire life and, like, how did, and, like, how did you end up, like, getting that first work experience? First job I ever, ever had was when I was four and I was picking strawberries for five cents of a uh, quart and I, made, and I made $20 one summer, five cents at a time. At what, four, you four four or five years old. Like that was four? my real first job, but I only got paid for strawberries. I didn't get paid for beans or corn or potatoes or anything, so I was a strawberry girl. I was picking strawberries. Um, oh my but my God. first real job that I actually got that wasn't uh, from my family was I was a paper girl. I would deliver newspapers back in the day when and we had newspapers and they got delivered. Um, and how did you and, get that uh, job? So after school, I would get on my bike with my paper bag full of bag full of papers and deliver deliver newspapers. No, and how did you like end up receiving that job? Receiving that job? Yeah. Um, I think the guy that had it before me was going into high school and got a better job, and so someone said we need a paper person, and I said I'm, and I was you know in seventh grade I think. Um, but my first then real job, like in the real workplace, I worked, in, unfortunately for me, I never worked in the restaurant industry, which was a huge problem when I became the CEO of the National Restaurant Association, so I tried to fix that, but I worked in grocery stores all through high school. 
Well, and uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to, to learn a huge amount, similar to, not, not as good, but similar to the restaurant industry in terms of teamwork and that kind of thing as a cashier okay. and then I worked uh, as a front end manager at the grocery store. Well, the reason I'm asking this is because like, I've, well, I, this may be sounding shocking, but I've only like worked one job, at, like one job that like pays in my life. Like, so I'm like trying to like know what is it that like, what is that key factor that's going to get you that job? Like, regardless, besides experience, if you've like never had work experience, what's going to, what's like that factor that like makes all the applicants? Well, hiring managers like go, wow, I want that person. That's a great question. I think, you know, part of it, unfortunately, it still is kind of who you know. You know, do you know somebody that's hiring? Do you have some kind of a connection? Even if it's five people removed, can you make that kind of, that's why LinkedIn and those kinds of tools are so great because you can find people who know people who know people who know people that are, are going to be offering jobs. So I think those, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I would highly recommend you do that like before you go to bed tonight. That's a fabulous way. And send me an invitation and I will accept it. And by virtue of that, you'll already have 5,000 friends that are all on LinkedIn that are connected to me that will, are all kind of all across the hospitality industry. And that's a, that's a really good way through research to be able to do that. I think it's a little different today than it was when I was starting out. Uh, but I do think um, those kinds of social networks become really important. Uh, but I think the thing that's the most important is your attitude. Do you come across as somebody who really wants to make a difference? That really, and, and that you can, you can tell immediately. You do, by the way. You have a great attitude. You come, you, you come right out. You can tell right away you're a positive uh, person who really, I don't think you're going to have any trouble at all. But if you do, you give me a call and I'll help you. <laughs> Everybody familiar with LinkedIn? Is that something that college students use? I know Facebook is like way antiquated, so I wouldn't even mention that. But LinkedIn, I think, is still pretty contemporary, isn't it? For business uses, at least. That's a... Yes, sir. OK, I'll stand. <laughs> um, I was wondering what the NRI's stance is on, uh, I've been seeing a lot of uh, publicity on changing the laws around going to a, f uh, a a higher minimum wage for, for uh, servers and striving to eliminate the uh, practice of tipping. And I was just wondering what the NRA stance was on that. Uh, our official position is that the market really will best determine the wage rates, uh, and so that having like a national minimum wage that is at a certain level is not the answer. Uh, at a certain point, you know, uh, a restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas is going to need to pay differently than a restaurant in San Francisco, than New York City, and the markets should really set those wages uh, more than, uh, although there may be a federal uh, minimum, we are not in favor of the $15, million, uh, 15, million, $15 minimum wage, for example. Uh, the elimination of the tip credit is a huge challenge for our industry because of the business model, uh, and so we're actually not in favor of that as well, or either. Uh, and it's challenging in this environment to have those positions, to be honest with you. And the entire restaurant industry is not always united around their point of view, depending if you're, if you're a quick service uh, concept versus a fine dining versus something else, fast casual. You have different business models. So it's challenging, I would say, more challenging than it's ever been at the national level for, for us at the National Restaurant Association to keep a... Uh, a position together that everybody can agree on. It's very hard. Uh, but I would say that is definitely our position at this point. We are very much in favor of the market driving uh, driving the, the labor market and the wages. And we very much, um, given the current business model in our industry, uh, are very troubled by the move to eliminate the tip credit. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, it's a pleasure to be with you and I thank you all for your attention and thank you for your good work. Very good, thank you, uh, Don, very much uh, for the insight, what's happening today and uh, for the growth and the complexity of the um, National Restaurant Association. Um, I want to say once again, it's a pleasure having you here on campus. It's been an enjoyable day, and um, I hope we can do 
in the future we can have a better relationship with the National Restaurant Association. Uh, there's plenty of jobs available for students that are looking for employment. And uh, I, I look at and really admire your career, the way you've done it, uh, professional growth, uh, progressive leadership, and with ethical uh, part of it is very, very, um, it's outstanding. So, and uh, I know that you worked on a farm, so you must have been one of the first people to do the farm to table concept uh, with your strawberries. But uh, I wanna thank you. I have a citation for you. It's the College of Hospitality Management honors Don Sweeney, President and CEO of the National Restaurant Association as the 60th Distinguished Visiting Professor for outstanding commitment and contribution to hospitality education this 31st day of January 2018. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations. So in honor of uh, President Sweeney, uh, there's a uh, DVP student scholarship uh, that we give out. And this year's recipient is Gabriella Grunin. And I'd like to have Gabriella uh, or Gabby come up to the stage, please. <laughs> So uh, as our friends call it, Gabby will be um, receiving a $2,000 scholarship in honor of President Sweeney, and it's renewable in each year until she graduates. Uh, what is outstanding about uh, Gabby is that she's a freshman, and she was selected by her faculty members to be able to have this honor, uh, this distinction as a scholarship recipient uh, for the DVP program. And this is the first time we've ever awarded a freshman this honor. So congratulations on that. And we do know that uh, with the students that we had a round table uh, discussion, uh, excellent conversation and uh, uh, President Sweeney and I agree that our future is really in good hands with students uh, and future leaders such as Gabby and her colleagues. Um, so I'm really, uh, it's really exciting and energetic uh, as far as our future. So congratulations once again, and I'm gonna have President Sweeney present this to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for attending today's uh, ceremony and have a good afternoon.